Welcome to the Inside Silverstone podcast, a business-focused podcast covering all things tech, engineering and innovation. Hosted by me, Chris Broom, a huge tech, motorsport and gaming fan and also the owner of Longhurst, a firm of lifestyle financial planners and independent financial advisors located in Silverstone, Northamptonshire. This is a series of unscripted and unpolished conversations with leading business owners, thought leaders and high-tech talent where we discuss their experiences within the Silverstone business and motorsport region. We will also be asking them to share their knowledge, insight and their thoughts on the future just for you. If you're looking to learn more about the Silverstone high growth region and commercially connect with like-minded peers, you've definitely come to the right place. Welcome to Inside Silverstone. Welcome to the next episode of Inside Silverstone. My name's Chris Broom and I am your host. I am delighted to introduce to you our next guest, which is Neil Patterson, who is the principal of the Silverstone University Technical College, or the UTC for short. Welcome to the show, Neil. Good morning. Right, Neil, as is customary, as I always explain on the podcast, as is customary, what I'd like to quickly do, with your permission, is run through a quick sort of CV of sort of education and career to date, just so that we can highlight the reason or the many reasons why we've asked you to come on the show. Is that okay if I run through yeah, that go quickly? Yeah. So I'm going to start with education. And I've asked your permission before asking this question. Um, but actually, you don't have a degree. No, I don't. I reconciled my fa- myself to that fact <laughs> a number of years ago. Yeah, yeah fine. And so, and so your, your sort of career progression, which ha- has predominantly been uh, design engineering, uh, and I'll come on to those companies in a minute, but presumably you... Uh, went through school and then went on an apprenticeship path. Yeah, I did, but that wasn't my plan. My original plan when I was at school, I I loved French and German, and I wanted to actually be a teacher of modern languages. Is that true? Really? Which is is completely bizarre when you consider the path that my career has taken. I now find myself working in a school. Um, So that's what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, But I also loved maths and physics, and technical drawing, yeah. um, and I did very well in all those subjects at O level um, back in 1985. Um, and I started doing A levels in French and German and maths, but not having enjoyed English very much, nobody had explained to me that in French and German A levels, I had to write critical essays of books written by French people in French, obviously, yeah. some hundred years previously. Mm. And I found it incredibly boring, and I just got completely switched off mm-hmm. to the whole thing. Um, and so partway through my first year of A-levels, I ended up leaving school. Um, and uh, because I was interested in technical drawing and maths and physics, mm. I got a job working as a, as a clerk in a drawing office of a local engineering firm. Okay. And then started the whole kind of day release college apprenticeship type thing, and that's what got me started in engineering. Okay, and and so and then that then led on from a sort of career path uh, to some dates and companies here. So from eighty six to ninety six, which would have been obviously just shortly after yeah. after that date you've mentioned, you worked for various companies as a, a design engineer. Uh, so sort of learning the trade, cutting your teeth, as it were. Yeah, and I was, I, I guess I was, um, I started. Um, in that drawing office, started doing some some drawing as well, and it was all ink drawings on tracing paper back then. Mm. But we were a fairly early adopter of CAD technology, mm. um, and that put me in good stead when an opportunity came up to work for a, an automotive design house based in West Sussex, mm-hmm. which was my first job in automotive, and then I went through that process. Mm-hmm. I found I was quite good at it, really enjoyed it, loved the engineering of parts of cars and what have you, so yeah. Good. And then from 96 to 99 became principal design engineer. So, you know, you did a, did a decade of learning your trade and then you joined Daewoo as principal design engineer where you worked for three years. Yes, indeed. Um, so they had a, a, a pretty substantial office down on, on the West Sussex coast in Worthing. And um, and it was a great place. Quite a small company. Mm. Gr- lots of opportunity to learn lots of different things within mm. the organisation. Mm. Um, but they did things really well, actually. They were really quite well advanced. And then that led on, and that experience, and, the, and clearly the knowledge and wisdom that you grew and learned from there, from 99 to 2013, so the thick end of sort of decade and a half, mm. you then became chief engineer 
at McLaren Automotive, yeah, which saw you uh, oversee the development and design of, and therefore the launch of, a uh, very well-known SLR, uh, and then the the very beautiful uh, 12C. What was that like? So that that career progression, and then ending up at McLaren, where you worked for you know it's a decade and a half, working on some just beautiful bits of kit. Mm. What was that like? Um, it was it was a real change. Um, when I first joined McLaren, I was one of six or seven people in the design office um, and 60 people overall. Mm. Um, they just got this contract to do the SLR for Mercedes, um, which at the time was the um, ended up being the, uh, the, the biggest volume carbon fiber production car that had existed. Mm. That's now been exceeded by the McLarens of today. Mm. Um, but I found in terms of technology, I was taking a bit of a step backwards. And McLaren at that time were a very, very young motorsport based automotive company. Mm. And they had to go through that whole transition to a fully fledged automotive manufacturer and global distribution network. Mm. So to be with them during that entire journey was absolutely fascinating. Mm. It meant I learned an absolute huge amount of, uh, of, of stuff across the whole realm of automotive engineering and the whole supply chain, quality, manufacturing, that whole thing, mm. and um, gave me much, much greater opportunities to learn and build my build my knowledge mm. than it would have been had I gone and worked for a big company straight away. So I, I felt that I really, really was a benefit. Um, but it was fantastic to be working on those kind of real cutting edge things yeah. where where you know my job in the, when I got up in the morning as chief engineer on the 12C was what can I do today that if the guy in in uh, in Ferrari knew about it he'd be cursing me <laughs> cool. that was that was the motivation Fantastic. Because what can I do to annoy my counterpart <laughs> yeah, yeah. in Italy yeah yeah and presumably when you you walk past or uh, a sort of 12C drives past you, you must look at that with fondness and think and just look at that as a sort of, you know, a third child, as it were. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's much more fun looking at a sports car going past and say, I had something to do with that than it, than it is my first job in automotive, which was working on a Leyland Daff van. And saying, <laughs> yeah, I worked yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think either, either way, I think anything that, that you will have engineered and produced, it must, it, from, from, from you know, the early beginnings through to, to you know, to, to the latter part of your time at McLaren, it must have, it's, it's all of that, it must, you must look at with fondness, thinking that, that that's a learning piece. Each time has been an iteration of learning and improving and, and developing. Yeah, absolutely so. Yeah, and it's it, it's it's great also to remember some of the some of the real technical challenges mm. that that dogged us at the time mm. that you know kept me awake at night mm. and ha- and the stories of how a team of incredibly high performing individuals got together and solved those problems. Yeah, and uh, and then and went on to innovate even further. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm just remembering, actually, I've got a client who's got a, a bright orange 12C, mm-hmm. and, uh, and he, he showed it to me last year, and uh, he's very, very happy. So I'll, I'll make sure he listens to this podcast, because, yeah. uh, the, uh, as I said, he's uh, very, very happy. He's been part of the McLaren Club, and a uh, yeah, very happy customer. Um, so, good. Um, so, basically, an entire career, or near the entire career, really, working as an engineer, chief engineer, becoming a master in your trade, clearly. Mm-hmm. And then in 2013, you had a, a sort of a, a career transition uh, and a vocational transition, and, and you moved from being a, a sort of chief engineer and ended up becoming ultimately a university stroke stroke school principal. Yeah. Uh, where uh, I, said, I, I then said earlier before the, the the interview started that you became sort of an academic engineer, where where you were then putting in place systems and processes and uh, and, the, and the groundwork to coach and lead the next generation yeah that was a that was as unexpected for me as it is for everybody who hears the story (laughs) um i was at work and i had a phone call from a recruitment agent and recruitment agents would phone up every now and again Mm. with opportunities Mm. um and the guy on the end of the phone said "Um, would you be interested in a job to set up and run a technical college based at the silverstone circuit and um 
I just assumed that they had the wrong person. So <laughs> while I had the phone in the crick of my neck, I was on LinkedIn looking for people called Neil Patterson who had any kind of educational experience whatsoever. Mm. I couldn't find any. So they, they'd obviously got the right person, but I didn't quite <laughs> understand why. What they wanted was somebody who could engage with industry um, to uh, facilitate partnerships between mm. the school and industry so the, the student learning experience is is more real mm. and more um uh, yeah more real yeah um they also wanted somebody who could represent the aspirations of the young people who would study at the utc yeah um now about 35 percent of our students go on to apprenticeships about 50 percent on to university and um not having been to university and having gone through that apprenticeship route and shown that you don't have to go to university to be successful mm. in any career. Yeah. Um, I think that was that was a, that was a story that they felt was a was a hook that was would be of value. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so having gone through that interview process, which included um, an interview with the then MD of Silston Circuits mm -hmm. in this very building where we're having this interview. Mm -hmm. Um, I found myself getting much more excited about the whole idea as I went through that interview process. So I was delighted when they appointed me. And so for those that haven't heard of the UTC or the Silverstone University Technical College, so so what is it? When 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 did it, when was it founded? Um, you know, it's a really stupid question. Where are you based? And and you know, what, what what's been the journey from 2013 to 2019 and early 2019? Okay, so so the first round interview that I had was on the first of November 2012, which was the day that they got planning permission to put the building up opposite the National Pit Strait at the circuit here at Silverstone. Okay. Um, so a real commanding view mm. of that strait, and we've got this lovely terrace that overlooks the strait, really great setting. Um, and it was set up by a group of people who recognised that this, this idea of a university technical college that's been adopted by government to provide high performance technical education to young people to serve the needs of the region's employers. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, we're right at the centre of this high performance technology cluster mm -hmm. right here. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were in the right place to do it and we should be doing it. So we're a, we're a school, we're an academy school, we're funded the same way as any other secondary school is mm -hmm. um, to deliver education to students from years 10 through to years 13. So that's the GCSE years and the A-level years. Mm -hmm. And in years 10 and 11, they'll study a whole load of subjects as any other student would, but with a major on engineering so two GCSE equivalents in engineering and we also have one class worth of students who study um, a business studies and events management specialism mm -hmm. okay um, so that's that two strands but it's again it's about serving the region's employers we're yeah. here for a reason we're not here just to get a whole load of exam results and 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 make our way up some pointless Tables. school performance table yeah, yeah. that's not what I'm here about my job doesn't end when my students put down the pen at the end of their last exam mm -hmm. my job ends when they're sustainably employed in the career they're choosing and so I continue to support my students well after they've left us through support we managed to get one of our students she went on to do a de mechanical engineering degree at Warwick University um, she got a first in her placement year before she goes back to do her masters we managed to work with our connections to get her a placement at Aston Martin for a year. Um, Bravo. Another, another student, only yesterday I forwarded on her CV, who she left us a year and a half ago, forwarded on her CV to one of our partner companies. Here's, what, here's a student, she's looking for a placement year, I've just noticed your advertising, It'd be worth having a look, that mm. kind of thing. Mm. And that, you know, once they come and study with me, they, they become my kids. Mm. Sure. Um, and I really want to get the best for them. That, and it doesn't end when they walk out the door in July of their final year with me. And so partnership wise, so you, you take the students through uh, clearly their, their educational path, um, you know, covering off presumably principles of English, maths, you know, all the sciences, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But there's clearly a, a slant towards, as you've said, either um, sort of high performance engineering or business and sort of technical events management. And then presumably you've then gone out to form partnerships because I've seen some of these on the website, so you can sort of help help fill these in. But with the likes of Mercedes, Red Bull, Aston Martin, as you've mentioned, Force India, I've also seen the Royal Navy. 
Or yeah, so we, we we do some stuff with the Royal Navy, that, um, they do a, an engineering challenge every year for UTCs where um, you have to, the one that we did last year was where you had to build a, a, a remote control boat that mm. could then um, pick something up off the seabed and they all go down to Portsmouth. We didn't make it to the final last year for one reason or another, um, working on it again this year. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a great, the Royal Navy are great supporters of UTCs mm. and they're actually a great place to start a career in engineering. One of our students ended up on their um, degree level apprenticeship scheme straight from our sixth form. Mm. Um, their starting salary on that scheme is 31 and a half thousand pounds a year. Boom! It's just there we are. Yeah, come on. Yeah, you can't go wrong. Yeah, there. yeah. And he's 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 in uh, under the sea most of the time in a submarine, <laughs> so he can't even spend that money. He must, he must be piling up. <laughs> but he's a bank doing, phoning him up saying, "Can you come take some money out, please? Because your account's full." But he's doing something he loves, yeah. and that and, and and that is in part because of the education he receives at the UTC. And so, what, what's the so you're saying? Obviously, from an educational perspective, uh, once they finish. Presumably you can help connect and you are helping connect students with businesses locally for things like apprenticeships. Yes. Um, any sort of success stories there, anything that's noticeable? Yeah, I mean, we're, I'm absolutely delighted to say that from the very first year that we had leavers uh, through till summer last year, we've put people into F1 teams every single year. Okay. Um, you know, we started started off with four or five, I think it was, going to Red Bull mm. um, that same year. We, we one of our one of our students had some work experience that we organised for her at Mercedes F1 in Brackley, um, and I think it was a, a re, I was really delighted to get a phone call from them to say we're about to advertise an apprenticeship. Can you please tell me um, what she got or what she's planning to get mm. and which qualifications she's doing because we want to make sure that she has an opportunity to apply for this post oh, yeah. and uh, so I gave the information the job ad went live they had hundreds and hundreds of people apply mm, must have yeah they got it down to um, two people one of which was our student and one other person the other person hadn't had any work experience mm -hmm. so to level the playing field they gave that other person some work experience yeah, yeah make it fair and, um, and our student got the job um, and she completed her apprenticeship. She's now employed by them, driving around in a brand new Mercedes. She's bought a house. There we are. You know, so great success there. Um, a couple of years ago, we took over half of the apprenticeship slots at Mercedes HPP with our students, um, and they're a great supporter of us. They yeah. do an, uh, 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 they they support an award each year, mm -hmm. um, where uh, the the winner gets. A, a check for five hundred pounds, which mm -hmm. is not to be sniffed at, sure. um, but a golden ticket to their selection centre for their apprenticeship, so they don't even have to go through the application process. Yeah, they they're just straight in. Willy so. Wonka, golden ticket. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's fantastic, and they're, they're, they're clearly phenomenal success stories. But clearly, a lot of hard work from the students before they can even get to that sort of position. So geographically, we're, you know, we're recording this interview now in Silverstone Park, Innovation Centre. You know, you guys are literally just over the road. Uh, are, are families and the students all local? Do you have the families coming in from other counties or even further afield? What's the what's the sort of geographic makeup of? Yeah, the as I said, we're here to serve the region's employers, mm. which means that we end up attracting students from the whole region. Yeah, and um, if you could see a map of where our students have come from, you'd think that we had loads of schools in the in, in and around this area, but mm. we don't. Mm. Um, the uh, the average distance to school for our students is 13 miles, okay. and you need to get out to almost double that to get to 85, 90 percent of students. Okay. So they're coming in from as far afield generally as um, Kettering and Corby yeah. to the north, yeah. um, uh, Buckingham, Aylesbury, even to the south, yeah. and out Bedford Way to the east and Banbury that kind of yeah, Cotswolds yeah. area but I guess but, but I guess you're niching in such a specialist area that, that those that are genuinely interested in it are going to make that journey well they make they make the journey absolutely and that has two benefits one um, one they're people who really know what they want to do and mm. so they're going to study hard mm. and two because of that the behaviour within the school is generally much better than it would be elsewhere oh, right, and people, yeah. people some, some students come to, to turn over a new leaf 
Yeah, and mm. they recognise they haven't had the best start to mm-hmm. secondary education. Mm-hmm. They come to us, and many of them will tell you that, that their behaviour in our school is much better with us than it was in previous school, and they really take advantage of that opportunity. But, you know, some people come from even further afield than that. We've had, in our first year, we had um, one student who came, and he and his mum lodged in B&B during the week so he could attend with us from Devon. Wow. Um, and... Uh, this year we've had a family relocate from Essex, um, and the whole family, whole family, yeah, have moved house, yeah, yeah. Presumably, dad's changed jobs, and yeah, all of that stuff. Mm. Um, and we've also got a student who's um, come from Scandinavia this year as well. So overseas, overseas, gone international, yeah. So within the EU, so they're entitled to uh, sure. education at the moment. Yeah, for now, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, so yeah, we're having that appeal on a, on a regional, national, and now international um, scales, which is it's, you know, it's fantastic. It's, it's, it's incredible pressure. I mean, it, yeah. it brings that pressure. I mean, obviously, I take responsibility for every student in our care, but it, but those little stories just really focus you and, and and make clear that that we've got a job to do to support. And, and work on this investment. We're almost like an investment bank where the parents kind of have their little nest egg mm. that they invest with us. And mm-hmm. our job is to grow its value mm. over the time that students are with us mm-hmm. such that they can then sell it on at the end of that time mm. to the Employees. highest bidder, yeah, yeah. You know, to, the, to, the, to the best employers in the region and uh, onto the best universities or whatever it might be. And what do you think, and what, what are the... Uh, the UTC's sort of biggest challenges at the moment? Um, I think the biggest challenge facing every school at the moment is funding. Yeah. Okay. The government will lie and lie and lie that they have increased funding. Mm. Well, they have increased funding. It's not a lie to say we've increased funding. But what they haven't acknowledged is that the, the costs that schools are having to put up with mm. In terms of increased energy cost, increased pension or national insurance contribution, well not national insurance, but pension contributions, mm-hmm. um, supplies, all those other things, which we have to buy. Mm. We can't not buy them. Well, you must those do as a UTC. So you guys, so presumably, so what's the funding situation with buying things like raw materials? And if you're if you're sort of a tech and engineering company at the <laughs> university, then presumably you've got to buy all that stuff as well. well. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. You know, we're teaching students how to use... Um, lathes milling machines machining centers so we're buying a lot of um a lot of metal we're um we're using 3d printers as well Mm. we're consuming more energy than most schools will Mm. but the funding we get per student is the same for a student who's doing a a purely um a, a purely engineering uh, sixth form course mm-hmm. of three equivalent of three A levels in size mm-hmm. for somebody who's doing English, history, and Greek at A level at some other school. So you don't get any ad- additional funding from the government to help contribute towards those those the additional costs. In sixth form, there's a small amount of additional funding for yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but in years ten and eleven, which is half of our students, there's no difference whatsoever. Wow. No difference. And um, what? And so what's the super question? What's the solution? But what's so? What's the What's going on to help sort of remedy that? Are there sort of lobbying groups? Are there, you know, yeah. what, what's going on? Yeah, I mean, just actually one other point that's worth making is that mm. our students come for a nine to five school day as well. It's a proper working day. Oh, wow, so it's an extra two hours. So, yeah, and so we're delivering a longer day mm. for the same money as any other school. So I've got to make that work from a budgeting point of view. Mm. And actually, I've got a great uh, chief financial officer and business manager who does that very very well mm. and we stay on top of the finances we haven't grown fat when there's been mm. you know over oversupply of funding in the education system mm. um but yeah in terms of lobbying you know we obviously have relationships with the education and skills funding agency and the department for education ourselves sure. but um there's an organization a charity called the baker deering trust um uh chaired by lord baker once education secretary under thatcher um and the whole UTC concept is his concept. Mm. Um, and as an organisation, they have close connections in government. And so they do an awful lot of lobbying on behalf of the UTC network. Um, but actually, this is an issue that's facing all schools, but yeah. particularly school, where there's a clear requirement for schools in the UK to improve their technical education mm. such that the jobs that 
could be there mm. if there were employee employees to do it mm. can be done in the UK rather than going overseas. Mm. Government recognises there's a need to do that. Mm. I think the government should recognise it financially and put their hand in their pocket and do something about funding technical education properly so that we can really do it properly. And if they're not going to do it, then the businesses that are benefiting from schools like mine... Mm. Maybe they need to be lobbying as well, the yeah. government, to say, we need more skilled workers, you need to put money into this. And actually, maybe, if you think about, go back to the days of Cadbury when they set up, they set up an entire village and schooling sure. and all the rest of that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the days where industry has to start spending some of its money mm. to support education. Maybe we need to do that. A lot of companies are being charged the apprenticeship levy mm, yes. nowadays. Yeah, yeah. And many of them are seeing that as an extra tax and the money just goes into the coffers of the Treasury. I'd like it, I'd love it, if the government would allow those businesses to use the apprenticeship levy to support training of students in schools like mine, mm. as opposed to directly with apprentices, mm. if they're not going to use it. I think you should go back into the education system, not just back into some yeah, other... Yeah, it's, it's just complete common sense. And, you know, the fact that the UTC exists, as you said, to serve the region, you are training the next generation of race engineers, technical engineers, people that are going to be building autonomous vehicles, and, yeah. and, and, and not necessarily just vehicles, you know, basically creating our future. Yeah, yeah, quite. Nah. And, you know, and the other aspect of that is that we, you know, we have these students coming from long distances, yeah. we have buses coming in from all these areas. Yeah, 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 transport. Where, where public services exist, fine, you can get that at a fairly reasonable cost, it's still a lot of money. Um, but where they don't exist, we provide buses and we subsidise that. So on my budget every year, I've got a 70, 80,000 pound line item, which is to subsidise the transport on buses to get kids to school. No other school has that problem because they just get kids pitching up from the local primaries into yeah, yeah. their school in a, in a town or a, a city. Oh, well, to be honest, I think the interview could just focus on this, this funding conversation. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm, I am now on my to-do <laughs> this equine, and I need to step off. Fine, let's talk about something else. So, so we um, we met um, because you know my business, Longhurst, is part of the Silverstone Technology Cluster because we're based on Silverstone Park. You know, we're one of the many, many businesses involved in, in the region and serving the region as well. Um, and you guys, uh, as in the, the, the UTC, as well as two other local um, schools, uh, Buckingham and, and Kingsthorpe, uh, were approached by uh, Gaia Innovation, um, the team run by Julia Muir, who was uh, episode 14 of season one of the podcast, where um, the focus is about bringing... Uh, and connecting um, or further connecting local businesses like Longhurst and many, many others with the students. So how have you, I mean, that's that's quite a new relationship because it sort of launched last year um, and you came in and did a short, short talk, which was really impressive, which is, again, why I've asked you to come on the podcast. Um, but how's it, how's it gone to date? Has there been uh, any initial sort of success stories, any yeah. sort of positive feedback? It's been really good. We've had um, uh, a couple of companies come in, um, one of them in particular talking about resilience in the workplace, yeah. um, other people working on... Um, uh, interview skills and CV writing, that kind of stuff. Great. All really important stuff. So it's really important that um, other people come in and do those things because sometimes as teachers, when you say these things, it doesn't necessarily come across or it just goes over the heads of the students. Whereas if somebody comes in from outside the organisation and says it's really important that you do X, Y, Z, all the things we know that we should do, mm. um, they listen to it a bit more. So that's really, really helpful. And, uh, and and I know certainly for one student, it really inspired them um, in terms of the resilience. It really inspired them. So it was a nice story. There. That's the main thing, isn't it? And I saw on social media, your, your some of the students came in and, and spent a day with uh, some of the businesses on site, so including Force India and others. Yeah, so um, that was a great opportunity for our students. It was about 50 of them, I think. Um, and they had... Uh, a day out of the office mm. and they visited Force India had a tour around there they had uh, Delta Motorsport make a presentation to them about mm. what they're involved in mm. they had Unity EV cars yeah. new company on site yeah, yeah. Um, uh, finding out what they were up to as well as uh, Hexagon Metrology yeah. um, and, and so four different organisations 
for those 50 students all in the space of one day mm. you know that is massive value for money um well it didn't cost us a penny so it's you exactly. know, even even better so yeah, the whole yeah. guy innovation thing um is is a real great boost to what we're doing in terms of careers um education and and the guidance Thing yeah, and, I, and, and it's totally agree, and that's one of the reasons why we signed up to, to, to work with Gaia as well. But and I've seen obviously on the website that uh, on your website that uh, that uh, you are looking uh, and would welcome support from from employers, whether they're part of the, the Gaia Innovation project or or not. Important to, to know that. Um, some of the things I've noted down here, you already mentioned the CV writing advice, clearly very very important, as well as interview support and practice. Um, yeah. Very yeah. very good certainly if they've spent most of their life behind their phones on, and on social media yeah. face-to-face interaction with a grown-up uh, that isn't a teacher or a parent or a relative yeah. um, is, uh, is is important um, obvious things like workplace visits and work experience yeah work experience is a big one in fact this this new thing new thing that's been talked about um in the term work placement so coming in 2022 mm. um earlier for some subjects but 2022 for engineering education are these new qualifications called t levels Mm -hmm. so they're qualifications for sixth form students um one t level is equivalent to three a levels in size okay um and it'll be all the same stuff that we're teaching them at the moment but with a with an idea of of packaging them up such that they're relevant to particular jobs Mm -hmm. yes in the future so that you are ready to be employed yeah so as an alternative to an apprenticeship path if you like Mm -hmm. um and uh part of that t level in order to get the certificates you need to have done a an extended work placement okay um of at least nine weeks duration Mm -hmm. now that's quite significant yes that is moving well beyond sweeping up and making the tea (laughs) yes yeah um and it needs to be relevant to the students. It needs to be a real job mm-hmm. um, and support their aspirations. And there needs to be proper outcomes expected from it. Mm-hmm. So it's of real value, A, to the, the student mm-hmm. and, their, and their future, but B, I very much hope for the employee em, employer mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but delivering a placement of nine weeks for an employer is quite a challenge. So... Um, I'm delighted that uh, Aston Martin have stepped up to the plate and offered um, offered six work placements of nine weeks duration to our students. Wow, this year. that's so, that's amazing. So that you know, kudos to Andy Palmer. He really gets it. He's gone through that apprenticeship route as well. Mm. Andy Palmer, who's their CEO, of course. Um, so he's he's he signed on the line straight away when I asked him, which is great. Um, but I'm on the lookout for other employers mm. who think they could make use of somebody for a nine-week period, either in one full block or maybe two or three blocks or one block and some day release. That yeah, kind so, of thing. so how would that work? So we can so there'll be employers listening to this. Mm. Um, uh, so so what's their commitment and is there a financial commitment and, and how do they go about doing this? Um, so. Uh, there's no financial commitment. I mean, they could choose to pay the students if they wanted to, but mm-hmm. there's no requirement to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about providing real work experience, yeah. real work experience, knowing what they expect to be able to do at the end of it, which might be part of the learning objectives of the replacement might be to confidently answer the phone to an outside caller when it rings yeah. and represent the company yeah. in a positive manner, you know, um, and building those other skills that make you that employable person and confidence and building that confidence yeah. building that resilience um it could, it could be any of those things mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um but the important thing is it's got to be relevant to the engineering sure qualification that they're taking but we're trying to build capacity to deliver that to what will be up to 150 students a year in 2022 okay and so we're starting now and we're planning to do 10 or 11 this year mm-hmm double it next year double it the year after but we can only do it if we've got companies who are willing to say do you know what i can invest in a young person for nine weeks well you know with the stc and silverstone park you've got a fantastic audience here you know stc has 100 members in it and member firms in it and yeah. silverstone park bowl accounts has several thousand businesses within an hour's drive mm. all of which are sort of serving the region so you've got a great 
sort of canvas here to, to to go out. Hopefully, with people listening to this podcast, they uh, they can potentially consider doing something. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge firm like uh, Aston Martin. It could be you know a much smaller organisation that potentially niches in a certain area yeah. or a design design or what have you, and, and they can just come in and learn and, be, and just be part of the the sort of corporate family. Yeah. For that for that nine and, weeks. And you know the the great thing is that we can do the matching. That's part of what we do. Mm. We 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 try and do everything we can to minimise the pain to the employer yeah. to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, you know, if an employer is out there and they say, I've got somebody and I really want them to do this particular aspect of my job, it might be I want somebody who can um, just do some uh, some working CAD that turns this file format into that file format or, mm-hmm. you know, th- things like that. You know, we can match it to somebody whose dream is to work with CAD. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If somebody says, we need somebody who can do some milling operations and um, for customers on this sort of thing, mm-hmm. um, we can match it to somebody who is confident on the machining centers. Yeah, yeah. And, and we do that work of matching skills and passions of our, of our students with the needs of the employers to try and make it easy. Essentially, what we're doing is we're also offering to those employers a try before you buy Yeah, service. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because why, if somebody why? attends a nine-week work placement and they've got apprenticeship vacancies coming up, yeah. you know, that's the, if they're, if they're any good, yeah. then, yeah. then they'll, they'll stay with them. It's an absolute no-brainer. And what's the, I've sort of heard on the grapevine about a, an event happening at Stowe with, yeah. with, with the, the, the UTC. So what's what's that? Yeah, I'm quite excited about this, actually. Um, so part of the thing that we that we like to do with employers is get them to talk to our students. And um, we've got a partnership going with Stowe School. They are possibly our closest school, actually. They're three mm-hmm. miles as the, cl- as yeah. the crow flies, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Um, and so what we want to we want to do towards the end, just around, either before, or just after Easter, we've yet to firm up a date. Is we're having a an, an engineering conference, so it's a dare to dream, inspiring engineering conference, mm-hmm. and uh, we've got a number of speakers from industry lined up, and we're going to get some um, alumni from both Stowe School and our school to come back and talk. So. Um, I've got Kevin Gaskell, who's agreed to be um, the keynote speaker for the event. Mm. Um, he was MD of BMW UK, Porsche UK, Lamborghini UK. He's an adventurer. He's been to the, the South Pole, walked to the South Pole. Mm. He walked to the North Pole. He went back to the North Pole because his son hadn't been. As you do. As you do. <laughs> um, he's climbed Everest um, this year. I hate him. I already hate yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. No, he's, he's a great guy, which makes it even worse. <laughs> um, this year, he's rowing across the Atlantic unaided with a team of people. Okay. He did, he did invite me to join him. I politely declined. <laughs> Yeah, I don't row at all, yeah. and, um, uh, and yeah, I'm not built for rowing. Let's put it that way. Well, by the end of it, you would be. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if I expired, I'd be good eating. Uh, you're fine. Um, so he's going to come and do a keynote speak, uh, and the idea of uh, we've got who else we've got? We've got the guy who's um, head of electronics for Rolls Royce has said he'll he'd support it. Um, we've Can, got anyone from the STC? Yes, we've got. Um, uh, We've got Kieran from KW Special Projects. He mm-hmm. said he'd support it. We've got Rob Lewis. He said he'd support it as well from uh, Total Sim. Great. So um, some local. Um, Simon Dowson as well from Delta Motorsport. He said he'd support it. So yeah. um, all date dependent and all the rest of that, yeah, obviously. Sure. But, so some good people. We've also got Dawn Bonfield, who was previously president of the Women's Engineering Society um, and um, is really big on inclusion in engineering. Yeah. Um, for the Royal Academy of Engineering. She's going to come down. I think it'd be really nice, possibly. I haven't asked her this yet, by the way. Um, really nice if we could get her and some of our alumni, our female alumni, who are now working in engineering from our school or Stowe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe a little panel discussion about that whole thing that perhaps she might might chair for me. That'd be valuable to the other la- ladies in the, in the crowd, yeah. the girls in the crowd. So I'm really excited about it. We've got some really, a real great lineup of speakers. I want to make sure that there's diversity there, not, in, not just in terms of... Um, um, uh, of the kind of gender balance, mm-hmm. which of course is a big problem we need to solve in engineering. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also in terms of the industries represented. So I've got a lot of a lot of friends in the kind of automotive and motorsport. I don't want it to be purely automotive and motorsport. Mm. I want speakers from diverse industries as mm. well within that high performance technology engineering sector mm. that, that we're so good at in mm. this region. 
that sounds exciting and if there's open tickets there i can pay then i'll definitely come to that but you know that so that, that sounds a great thing i could even come along and do a podcast but that's another conversation but look that sounds fantastic right we are 38 minutes into the interview um and thank you for sharing all of that invaluable information not just about sort of career journey um but also about the utc's journey um challenges for the future which i guess are always going to be there so it's just about sort of pivoting and moving around those mm. and, and, and doing what you can schools project with guy innovation let's talk just very briefly and then we can close off the interview just a little bit about you if that's okay mm-hmm. so we've obviously done the educational piece and the career piece but presumably you live locally yeah in, i do yeah in, in, live, the, in the region just, yeah just just up the road in toaster okay fine so yeah i'm in woodburcott so mm-hmm. uh, so relatively close to each other and so presumably you've been there for for a while yeah i moved directly there when when i took this job so five uh, and a half six years ago yeah fine uh, and so ha- and there obviously with uh, you know young family um uh, what do you think to northamptonshire as a region south northamptonshire i love it do you know what i i uh used to live in wokingham and drove to woking i used to live in embrook did you? How weird is that? Oh, right. I went to school there. Who's following who? <laughs> weird. There we are. So, um, <laughs> so I probably know some of your old teachers. <laughs> probably. <laughs> anyway, weird. How do we not know this? Right, yeah. anyway. So, so, um, so uh, my journey from Wokingham to McLaren at Woking, for the 18 miles it was, when I started there in 99, was a 36-minute, 35-minute journey. When mm. I left, it was 55 to minutes to an hour. Yeah. Moving up here, it's just like, oh, my goodness, I can roll up to a junction and pull out without stopping. I've yeah. never done that for yeah. 15 years. Um, but we're just so close to such wonderful countryside around here. Yeah, it's beautiful. So um, uh, on the mental health ticket, I bought myself a motorbike in April for the first time in over a decade. Yeah. Um, and it is good for my mental health to get to get out and go for a ride yeah, and yeah. just enjoy the scenery, um, uh, a bit of adrenaline burst if I if I need it. Yeah. All within the speed limit, of course. What's, um, what's the bike? I've got a Triumph Street Triple, okay, seven six five cc. So um, yeah, 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 really good fun. And um, and I love I love it. Mm. It's a lovely part of the world to live in. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the transition for the girls and so your family, so your children. Moving up here, change of school, new friends, but yeah. different, different way of life, I guess, in the countryside. Yeah, that went really well for them. They're so adaptable, young people, aren't they? They're sure. so adaptable, so it was great for them. Especially as a dad that then became a principal of a school, so they, they should be they should be adapting, shouldn't yeah. they? Um, it's traditional for me to close off the podcast interview with a couple of sort of closing off questions. Um one of which I've changed for season two of the podcast. The first question is all about embarrassing mistakes okay. uh, because we all have them whether it be professionally or, or personally um, and the, the, the point of me asking this question is just to really to bring light and, and, and have some fun with it to say actually look we, we could make a mistake that makes us look a bit stupid but actually the, the, the key is learning about that and, and using it as a moment to say okay I'm not going to do that again or I'm going to try not to do that again so and we've had some absolute corkers from, from Roz's to Mike's to everyone else's that, that have come before you on season one so is there anything that's happened to, to Neil Patterson along his career path that you could be prepared to share including the fact that there will potentially be students listening to this in the future oh, i hadn't thought about that um <laughs> yeah 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 I've, I've got a story i had i'd not been at mclaren very long and um i was somewhat in awe of gordon murray as the you know the inventor or if you like of the of the mclaren f1 road car okay. still an iconic vehicle yeah um and uh one monday morning after the goodwood festival of speed um where all the employees had been given tickets. Mm. Um, uh, I bumped into Gordon first thing in the morning as he was coming up the stairs. And he said, oh, did you make it to the to Goodwood? And I said, yeah, I, I said, I, I didn't get down there till quite late, though, because I'd been at a party the night before. And he said, well, I was at a party at Damon Hill's house um, until three o'clock in the morning. I was still there first thing. Mm. We had a little bit of a joke about that, and I said, I said, uh, yeah, I saw Damon Hill there in the paddock. I said, um, I said he's grown his hair very long, and Gordon's kind of nodding. I said, and it's kind of gone, kind of half grey, and he's nodding. I'm not registering at this point that Gordon has, for a very long time, had quite long hair, and it's kind of greying. <laughs> and uh, I said, he just looked really silly. So apologies to Damon if he's listening. Um, 
he just looked really silly. And then, of course, I look up, and that's the point at which I register that Gordon's looking at me, stony-faced, with his long, greying hair. Because you've inadvertently taken them in. uh, So I'm into full-on reverse mode at this point. (laughs) I dump it straight in, cogs flying everywhere in the gearbox. And... um, and I say, of course, some people can carry it off, but it just didn't work. <laughs> Gordon just turned around and walked away. Oh, Not right. a word was said. And there I we felt are. quite stupid, yeah. Well, <laughs> what a good story. Look, these things happen, don't they? Certainly if it was first thing in the morning and, uh, you know, you'd, have, you'd had a, a couple yeah, of a beers. a long day. A yeah. couple of beers the night before yeah. or whatever. Is there anything, before I get on to the last question, anything that I haven't asked that um, that you'd like to sort of cover off before we close? I don't think so. Cause I'm in danger of getting onto my high horse again. No, so, we're not uh, going to so do, do that. We're not going to do that. But what, what I, I definitely want to do um, is get you back on the show in, say, a year's time, um, a year, year and a half's time after which certainly the Gaia Innovation Project will, will be sort of full, fully underway and we'll hopefully have a lot more sort of positive feedback stories, including hopefully myself and Longhurst coming in and, and, and speaking to the students. So I'd love to get you back on the show. Um well, we can then talk about funding again to see whether or not anyone at the Treasury is still listening to the podcast yeah. and is, is taking us on board, as we know they are. Um, last question. I've changed. Um, drum roll. So the last question I used to ask, which you, which, uh, you won't be aware of, is um, what bit of life advice could you give Chris Broom? Mm-hmm. And I've had some absolute peaches through season one, most of which is sum, summed up by do the job that you love. Mm-hmm. but season two now of the podcast so I've changed the question and the question is this um, it, when you look back at your career from sort of apprentice through to cutting your teeth as a design engineer through to principal design engineer through to chief engineer now through to educational engineer or UTC mm. principal what bit of advice would you give your younger self mm. When I think back on my career path that I talked about earlier, it kind of jumped around a little bit. And it's kind of interesting that I'm in a kind of teaching role, educational role now, when I originally wanted Mm. to be a teacher. Gone full circle. But when I reflect on who I was at school, and I read all my old school reports the other day, it's really quite clear that... I was much more interested in technical stuff than I was in uh, languages, Mm. even though that's what I chose to do at A-level. And so I think the career, the advice that I would give my younger self would be make sure that when you're at school, choosing your GCSEs or even while you're doing your GCSEs, make sure you get some really good advice about careers about what qualifications you need to do what kinds of jobs, Mm. about the courses that you're thinking about taking so that you don't start them and find that they really aren't for you. Mm. It's not the end of the world if you make a mistake at that time, but it puts a couple of years into the process and maybe delays the time at which you can start earning money. But I think that would have been better. I think looking back, my school could have easily seen that I would have been better suited to a career in engineering Mm. than I would have been teaching modern languages there we are sage advice Mm. Neil that's it podcast is done great thank Thank you you. so much for coming on the show Um, we'll get this produced um, and this will be out in February March 2019 um what would be good is um, if we can get some any any sort of uh, website links or any any information that you want to and are happy to share with the listeners, whether that be from employers through to students and even potentially people that aren't part of students who are part of the UTC or families that aren't here yet, but are potentially considering sort of coming into the region. Anything you can provide us link wise uh, that we can put in the show notes would be fantastic, please. Yeah, sure. Um, and obviously, good luck with 2019. Obviously, all the projects you've got coming up. Um, and with hope Longhurst and, and I Chris Broom will be in uh, uh, into the school at some point uh, potentially to do something on financial literacy in, in the workforce yeah, that'd be nice. um, come in and talk to them about actually money behaviour you know when they you know, get their first paycheck what they need to be thinking about mm-hmm. uh, which isn't uh, buying trainers and, yeah. uh, and gadgets and it's potentially about more sort of growing up things so yeah happy to come in and, and, and do that um, but 
thank you for coming on the show and uh, I will uh, I'll, we'll, we'll see you soon yeah cheers cheers now The Inside Silverstone podcast is produced by the team at Longhurst for the benefit of those with a passion for all things tech, engineering and innovation. For more information, please visit longhurst.co.uk forward slash Inside Silverstone, whilst also remembering to give us a 5 out of 5 star rating on iTunes. Please note that neither Chris Broom or Longhurst work for Silverstone Park, Silverstone Circuit or Silverstone Technology Cluster.